Okay, so um, you've, you've reached the right place. Uh, we are here together for Poets and Writers Bay Area Literary Presenter check-in virtually. And um, I just wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your busy days to join us to get today, to join each other really. Um, to check in with one another. Uh, Poets and Writers is uh, providing this format, kind of like a template, um, and you are actually filling it with all of your experiences and um, things that you're going to bring to the table today. So I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Jamie Asai Fitzgerald, and I am the director of Poets and Writers California office and our Readings and Workshops West mini grants program. I'm here today with my colleague, Dan Tran Kong Wen. She is going to be uh, doing all things tech support related, uh, making sure the meeting runs smoothly for us. And um, she has the enviable job of keeping time <laughs> when we do our check-in. Um, we'll each have two minutes to talk, uh, to update each other on things that are going on. And um, Dan Tran's going to uh, interrupt if and when folks uh, reach their two minute limit. Um, when that happens, don't panic, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a gentle reminder to just wrap up um, your, you know, last uh, things that you want to say. Um, but, but don't worry if you go over a little bit. It's okay. Um, I do think we're going to have enough time for everyone to say what they need to say and uh, have a little time for discussion at the end. And I think we'll be able to do all of that great stuff within an hour. So um, I'll try to keep good time for that. So um, I just wanted to uh, say, I think you all already know this because you've probably been on Zoom a whole heck of a lot these last few months, but please stay muted while other people are speaking. When it's your turn to talk or if you want to talk, you can unmute and, and then speak. Feel free to uh, express your appreciation. Uh, you can use the little clap hands or thumbs up, or you can just do stuff in the <laughs> Zoom window. If you, if you like something somebody has said, that's great. Uh, you can also put any questions you have or suggestions or resources that you want to point out in the chat window um, at the bottom of your screen there is a chat function that allows you to open that window and write messages into the chat and at our last check-in which i did a couple weeks ago for los angeles presenters i was able to save the chat and email that to everybody after uh, because there were a lot of links and resources in there that people wanted so i will do that again uh, for this one and uh, feel free to use that and um, I just wanted to you know just say that I thought it was really uh, important to do something like this usually we have writers and presenters and all kinds of people at, at the meetings that Poets and Writers organizes in California but for this particular period, I was really interested in hearing from folks who are literary presenters to hear about the challenges that you're facing during these crazy, unprecedented times. And I also thought that, you know, we're all trying to carry on work uh, during social isolation. And not only um, are we experiencing you know global pandemic but also social political movements that are happening right now um, with black lives matter police brutality an upcoming election and not to mention 
climate change. I know the air quality up where you are has been pretty, pretty terrible. So um, I thought, what better opportunity for us to kind of hear from each other and hopefully share some resources or at least sympathize <laughs> a little bit. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will go a long way. So before we get things started, I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous. First off, um, I wanted to thank the California Arts Council because they are supporting the community building convenings that we organize for California. So thank you very much, California Arts Council. And I wanted to just briefly say a few words about poets and writers. Um, we are the nation's largest nonprofit serving creative writers. And uh, our mission is to foster the professional development of poets and writers, and also to help make literature available to the widest possible public and to promote communication throughout the literary community. And these meetings um, speak directly to that, to promoting communication throughout the literary community. So here we go. Um, I'm going to call on you and I'm going to, I hope that um, each of you will take your full two minutes to um, give your updates. And I think what I will do is, um, because the participant list in Zoom is constantly changing and shifting around, I'm going to call on you by your organization name or project name, and then you can introduce yourself. Um, so let's get started with our two minute check-in. Um, as you know, um, We'd all like to hear how this time of upheaval and social isolation has impacted the work of your organization or project, what you've had to do to adjust or respond, what resources you've found valuable or need, and if you like, a project or event that you're currently working on. So in alphabetical order, if Babylon Salon is with us, um, I'd like to um, ask Lauren, I think, to unmute. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for organizing and inviting um, us to join. I'm really happy to be here. Um, hi, my name's Lauren um, from uh, Babylon Salon. I'm one of the co-hosts. So um, as a reading and performance series that's been running for 13 years, uh, creating a space for literary enthusiasts to connect over art, um, as well as a beverage, is one of the joys of organizing Babylon Salon. Um, we hold our events at the Armory Club and the Mission in partnership with the Booksmith, um, and we value being able to support these local businesses. So to that point, we miss the bustling table we used to set up for book selling and author signings um, at the event. Um, and we miss the Armory Club's cozy performance space, which was conducive to socializing and audience participation and getting people excited about the books. Um, and unfortunately, we had to cancel our March event we missed out on hosting some amazing writers, um, including C. Pam Zhang and Deb um, Olin and Firth. Um, to adjust, we've moved our quarterly events to Zoom and have continued to promote them on social media, um, just the same as we would our in-person accounts, um, and continue to work in partnership with the Booksmith. Um, and just drop those links uh, in the chat during the event. Um, most importantly, this time has really taught us that we really must commit to creating truly inclusive events with more space for Black, Indigenous, people of color, authors, and performers. Um, we've been learning a lot from attending other online literary events, um, especially when it comes to format, performance length, encouraging um, participants to use the chat box, um, share favorite passages and sentences from the readings. We really try to get people involved during uh, with the chat box. And also we've learned how to keep Zoom bombers at bay. Um, so upcoming, we have our next salon, which is a celebration of Black authors and performers, and that's on September 12th, and will feature writers like Cherie Renee Thomas and um, local author Faith Adile. And you can learn more at BabylonSalon.com. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, that was a really succinct and also awesome update. And we'll move on now to um, the Bay Area Book Festival. 
Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Uh, my name is Suzanne Rebecca, and I am the festival writer and development manager for the Bay Area Book Festival based in Berkeley, California. And um, I've been with the festival since November 2019. And we are a, an in-person annual weekend event. We started in 2015 and every year since then, around usually around June or May um, in 2020, it was supposed to be the weekend of May 2nd to 3rd. Uh, we have an in-person annual two-day weekend festival in downtown Berkeley, um, which consists of not only um, a bunch of venues uh, featuring panels and conversations with about 200 different writers from all over the world, um, but also a big outdoor fair in downtown Berkeley that's entirely free to the public and consists of a lot of interactive kids activities, a young readers stage, just uh, it's basically an event that's that's centered very much around in person communication in person. Um, uh, interaction and it just sort of like being there together in a in a public space and so. Our transition into virtual events, uh, specifically Zoom events, has been kind of a whirlwind since we've never really done virtual events before um, prior to COVID. Um, and so in early March, we made the decision to cancel our, uh, our annual weekend event in May and decided to go entirely virtual. And that consisted of uh, a very, a very steep learning curve for everyone in the organization, but we ended up just sort of rolling with it and, and buckling down and producing a pretty huge amount of virtual content. We've produced so far uh, 53 programs since May 1st um, on our YouTube channel. We've completely revamped our YouTube channel because um, it was very outdated. Uh, we've completely revamped our website to focus hey, on it's time to wrap up. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so 53 programs. And then what we're working on now currently is an October program called Berkeley Unbound, which features uh, Berkeley affiliated authors talking about the current inflection point that we find ourselves in politically. So that's happening October 4th. Thank you very much. And um, let's move on now to Beast Crawl. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Corman Roberts, uh, one of the core founder of co-founders, co-organizers of uh, the Beast Crawl Literary Festival, uh, which uh, began uh, in usually the last weekend of July, the first weekend of August in 2012 uh, in downtown Oakland. Uh, and it's very similar to um, Lit Quake's Lit Crawl event, but three rounds of uh, simultaneous readings. Um, happening uh, in three rounds. So you basically have 12, 12 readings going simultaneously at an early hour in the evening from five to six, a half hour break until 6.30 so people can get uh, beverages and refreshments. Um, and then a second round of readings from 6.30 to 7.30, another half hour break, and a third round of readings from 8 p.m. till 9 p.m. Uh, this was an annual festival and I think at our peak we drew 3,000 people to downtown Oakland. Uh, for a total of something like 48 events uh, in one of the years. Um, we had ceased operations due to a lack of, um, due to a lack of <clears throat> volunteer staff because it's entirely a volunteer operation, uh, usually with a budget, maximum budget of no more than 1,500 per festival, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, so we ran out of staff support or volunteer support in 2017, and we're actively making plans to bring it back in 2020 until the pandemic hit. And there had been some talk about trying to get the festival back on, uh, do it all virtual, do it all online in the summer of 2020. Um, but the, 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 the beginning of the protests and the beginning of the new civil rights movement, beginning with George Floyd's murder sort of derailed that. We felt that it was very trivial at time to sort of be focusing on a festival at a time when uh, we're looking more at social unrest and social justice. Uh, but there is, there, there is a, desire to bring the festival back next year. So that's where we're at, honestly. Great, thank you for that update. Up next is the Berkeley Poetry Festival. Hey everyone, um, I'm Kate Chavez and I am one of the co-directors of the festival. 
Uh, we are uh, a yearly event. Um, we kind of organize around the um, honoring of, of a, one specific person who we give a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, we give that award in collaboration with the city of Berkeley. And uh, we have traditionally had a day long event. So kind of an ongoing day long event. So we start around 11 and keep going until around, until around five or six in the evening kind of culminating with the award being given out. So the shift um, has been um, kind of a big one. Um, and we actually took the approach of waiting to see what was gonna happen and uh, deciding officially to transition to, um, to a fully virtual event, um, but also um, changing it to not just pivot, pivoting completely from not just having the event in person, but also thinking about um, what people need and what is most accessible for folks. One of the things about our program is that we are 100% free. We always have been. Um, and we serve a specific, I think, need in the community around connection. And so we're trying to recreate that um, online. Uh, so we've planned uh, three days of events, kind of uh, reading pods that focus on specific uh, different themes. Um, and this year we are um, honoring Michael War in his work in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also recognizing the contribution of African American and Black writers to American poetics. So every pod is organized around that major theme and um, then sub themes. So for example, we have Afro surrealists, we have dance and poetry. We have hey MK, it's time to wrap up. Thank you. Um, and we have um, uh, Afro Latinx folks. So the transition has been pretty big and we got hit with uh, a loss of funding. So exciting times. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next up is California Poets in the School. <clears throat> All right, hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Meg Hamill, I'm the Executive Director of California Poets in the School. And we have one major literary event that we present annually and we typically do it in person. We, it's called the Symposium. Um, and this year for the first time we went virtual, which was a huge learning curve for, for us, but it ended up being incredibly successful in a, lot of, in a lot of ways. And the obvious ones were because we are a statewide agency, when we hold this event in person, there's a, there's a limited number of people who can actually show up. And so holding it virtually really allowed all the folks who want to come every year, but can't for 105 reasons, to, to show up. And since the symposium, we've had a lot of folks asking us to continue to do this virtually in the future, no matter what happens. And so that's something we're going to wrestle with. There's a there's something magical that happens in person, but there was something, an energy that was brought virtually that was also very inspiring and surprising to me. So the, the great thing was that we could offer it for free by donation and <clears throat> that also busted down all the barriers. So the, you know, the feedback that we received from the symposium was let's do more stuff like this. We're isolated. Um, the poet network that we support wanted more opportunities to gather online. So from that symposium feedback, we had been creating a series of online events, including a monthly a monthly meeting, which involves training. So we're using this time to train ourselves on some of the skills that maybe we have not been focusing on enough in the past. So hiring experts to come in and help us ramp up our skills for teaching in the classroom. And then also beginning a quarterly open mic series, which is something our poets were really asking for among our, amongst our network. Um, so there has there's been a huge call. Got it, I see you. Okay. It's been a huge call for, for more online connection and we're trying to answer that call in, in the ways that are possible. Um, so that's, that's what we're up to. It's, it's kind of exciting. It's also kind of sad 
but there are some new doorways that have opened that have been, um, yeah, I think surprising to everybody in a, in a good way, so. Thank you, Meg. Okay, up next is City Arts and Lectures. Hi, everybody. My name is Allie. I'm from City Arts and Lectures in San Francisco. It's really nice to meet everybody and hear what everybody's going through. Um, we are a live conversation series in the city. We do 50 to 60 events in the Sydney Goldstein Theater. It's a 1700 person theater. We do about 60 of them a year. We also rent out the theater as a side thing. Um, and so, like it sounds like a lot of you guys, we had never done an online event before. There were a number of challenges shifting to that. We're also a very old school organization by nature. So there was some difficulties in just switching things to digital. Um, technical things, just like knowing how to do things, how to get people, I mean, especially our audience, a lot of them tend to be a little bit older. There's like technical challenges in helping people navigate how to use Zoom or whatever. Um, we've kind of figured that out now for the most part. We've tried a couple different things. Um, we had to switch about 20 events that were already scheduled to be at the theater onto online, which was actually more challenging than what we're doing now, which is announcing new programs, obviously, that are only straight to online. Um, we had to hire a new staff. Well, we had to expand the role of a previously like contract only staff person just to help us navigate the technical hurdles of all of this. Um, and we've also, I mean, we're actually a very small team, but one of the challenges we find is that even though we're only four people, actually getting everybody to be online at the same time in order to get things done and to be effective is challenging in itself. We are using Slack, um, which helps, but um, it is what it is. Um, we uh, thankfully were about to do a membership drive right when all of this happened. Um, and for the first time, we actually did a. Um, hey, and Allie, just, it's time to wrap up. Okay, sorry. Uh, we did a general call for support, which we had never really done before. We'd always kind of shifted it around membership levels. And to just do a general call, we actually found to be really helpful to us. Um, people were donating $10 and $20 and not just specific to membership levels. Um, so that's been really nice. I have a lot more, but it's okay. Thank you. All right, and, and hopefully we'll have a little time at the end if anybody really wants to say more stuff um, or make suggestions. Okay, next up. We have City Lights. Hey everyone, nice to see you guys. Um, it's, uh, my name is Stacy Lewis and I'm here in Berkeley. Um, so City Lights is a publisher and a bookstore publishing staff. A lot of us are working from home. Um, and just a quick rundown so I don't get the gong. Uh, so City Lights, uh, mid-March we closed. Uh, and we stayed closed till mid-June. We had no source of income. Uh, we had no way to make money at all uh, in terms of a bookstore. Uh, we ran a GoFundMe campaign in April. We raised half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, that money has allowed um, City Lights to keep all of their staff uh, paid with health benefits. Uh, no one's been let go, no furloughs. Uh, it's a beautiful, unusual thing. The bookstore is now open every day, Monday to Sunday, noon to eight, come visit us. Um, we have shifted our events to an online virtual platform, City Lights Live. We do them on Zoom. We used to use Crowdcast. I can talk about both those platforms if people have questions. Um, we, it's a challenging time right now. Uh, but I don't really need to say that. Everybody knows that, right? Uh, we're connecting via social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Go check out our Instagram. My coworker Josiah has been uh, curating poets reading from the mezzanine of City Lights, and it's fantastic. We got Tongo Ice and Martin up there, and Leticia Hernandez. Um, every day feels like the same and kind of different, and we're evolving. And I think I'll just stop there before I get cut off.
Thank you, Stacy. Up next, we have the Clarion Performing Arts Center. Hi, everyone. I'm Clarice Sue, and I'm the director of Clarion Performing Arts Center. And, um, uh, you know, aside from all the events being canceled, I just want to focus on the poetry part. And I've always wanted to have poetry and theater together. So the two poetry shows that got canceled this year um, was a poetry burlesque show titled Script Tease Burlesque. And another one is the International Poetry and Music Day. So to keep Clarion um, in the mind of its community, I turned to video productions um, and many thanks to Zoom and YouTube because without that, it's not going to be possible. And uh, I have produced a series of skits um, under uh, uh, Clarion Performing Arts Center and um, it's titled Move Over Corona. So there are three skits under that series. And then um, we presented a video version of last year's stage performance of um, a poetic play called uh, Love on the Magpie Bridge. And uh, we have a summer theater with the students of Clarion. I managed to have rehearsals with the students um, who signed up for the summer theater and, uh, you know, using Zoom. And we're going to be producing the new play called The Piano and it's coming out as a play movie in October. And as far as um, future plans, I'm, I'm planning to reopen. I plan to, you know, um, tighten the belt and uh, keep the music center until it can be reopened. So I am working on a project to- Hey Clara, it's time to wrap up. Oh, okay. So my project is to have a poetry reading for children in a bakery that is um, down the street from Clarion. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Up next, we have the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal. Um, I'm Alan Srogoff. I'm one of the co-editors of the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal with Cesar Love. And we meet together to exchange manuscripts. Uh, I get manuscripts mostly in the mail. And uh, right now, it's been a little difficult because we meet uh, with masks and six feet apart. and we're trying to go over the final submissions, uh, but we need to uh, be able to do that in person. And uh, some of our writers don't use computers. I go out to the post office a lot and, uh, you know, have to stand six feet away from people. And uh, the uh, Zoom could help us potentially if we do a reading because we usually have readings and so far the journal has been in two virtual magazine fairs, one through PEN America and the uh, CLMP. Uh, we usually take the journal to bookstores. Uh, City Lights has been great in the past and all the consignment people have been great, but currently the small magazine section isn't uh, up right now uh, because of social distancing and the Beat Museum where we also go is closed. Um, so we're a little bit behind in our getting our next issue out, but that's what we're working on right now. And we do have a lot of poems that relate to social justice and we have several writers from Zimbabwe and we usually have about 40 to 60 writers that I interact with and um, because our street salesperson died recently, uh, we'll probably emphasize subscribers more than we usually do. And I am wondering about fairs uh, like Watershed, because every year we go to Watershed and I think that'll be virtual too. Is it getting time to? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alice. 
I, I had hoped that uh, Joyce would join us, but I, she did an RSVP for this one, but um, maybe next time. Um, okay, up next, we have the Mechanics Institute. Hi, uh, my name is Taryn Edwards, and I am a librarian and strategic partnerships manager for the Mechanics Institute, which is right in downtown San Francisco. It's a pioneering library event center and chess club founded in 1854. So we shut down on Friday the 13th and uh, Mechanics is most well known for its small group experiences. Uh, we had at that time 13 writers groups, a couple of book discussion groups and writers classes and a wealth of speaker events and chess activities. So all that met in person and of course it ground to a halt um, it took us a few weeks to kind of get our Zoom accounts <laughs> settled, um, but by April 9th, we were running full steam again. Um, personally, what's been really difficult is helping our senior members and our not so senior members figure out all the intricacies with Zoom. Um, so many of them don't have the right equipment. Uh, and for a time, you know, supplies like cameras and stuff were low. And so it was really hard to get everybody on board. But um, thankfully, that's kind of uh, waning and people are getting up to speed uh, with virtual events. On the plus side, um, virtual events have allowed us to uh, double or even triple our attendance. So uh, and the level of general engagement has really improved. Um, there's lots more questions. There's a lot more conversation, it seems like. So, so there's a win. <laughs> um, and now the biggest hurdle for us is deciding, do we want to stay with Zoom or do we want to move to a different platform that will um, allow us to brand a little better and have a little more control over the look of events. Um, and we want to be able to take it directly through. And the workaround that Eventbrite has isn't really very isn't good for us. Um, and of course, the trouble finding is finding the time to do all this because I personally host Hi, Taryn, it's time to wrap up. Thanks, three events a week. Um, and then the next one is in fact with Berkeley Poetry Festival um, Lifetime Achievement Awardee Michael War and his literary partner Chun Yu. Anyway, thanks. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Taryn. Um, I'll, I'll have more on, on uh, platforms later. I have questions for you about that, but let's move on to Moondrop Productions. Do we have our Moondrop Productions rep here? Okay, it looks like we'll skip that and go to Poetry Center San Jose. Hi, everyone. Thank you for hosting this uh, gathering. Can you hear me? Because I've had some problems with my computer. OK, great. Uh, well, uh, Poetry uh, Center uh, in San Jose has had many disruptions, of course. Uh, we've not been able to execute any uh, congregate events uh, because of the situations pivoting to online programming. Uh, for readings and workshops. Uh, we're on Zoom and some of our staff are also using OBS, Open Broadcast System. And uh, we're looking at StreamYard, which is in browser, uh, some things to make it simpler. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, OBS is a little bit of a learning curve there. We manage our efforts uh, to be within the capacity of our board and volunteers to execute programming because we've had uh, uh, some of our board members have had deaths in the family and illness and uh, because of the fire, some loss of property. So uh, a, a lot of challenges. And so we can't really uh, uh, move forward on, on some of the ideas that we've had uh, <clears throat> just to be responsible on that. Uh, we're currently working on offering the San Jose Poetry Festival, September 8 through 13. Uh, we're putting together a literary journal, Sejura, and we're uh, judging the Red Wheelbarrow Poetry Prize and putting together uh, an anthology for, of poetry for veterans and uh, family members of veterans. And uh, we're developing a plan as to how to continue to cultivate our relationships uh, with people who have joined us 
from other states because of Zoom. And uh, what we're going to do when uh, this all resolves, uh, because we were very much interested in continuing those relationships. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Rich Oak Events. Hi, everyone. Uh, that would be me. My name is Tino. I'm here today representing Rich Oak Events, coming to you all from um, sunny, smoky California. Uh, yeah, I'm just, let's see. Uh, so, Rich Oak Events is a uh, fairly recent developing org. Uh, we are responsible for three different shows. Uh, we collaborate with a handful of others. We started off as the Rich Oak Alchemy Open Mic and then amassed two of the longest running poetry slams in the Bay Area, uh, that being the At Open Slam and the Breakthrough Slam. Uh, and then before the pandemic had started, we uh, we opened up a YouTube channel uh, called Bay Poets Tonight. We're there, we uh, live stream all of our shows for accessibility purposes. Um, and then also regularly publish other like poetry videos on there. Um, since the pandemic, we have uh, sustained uh, weekly shows on there. Um, so we've like been like doing our shows live and we've been regularly paying our featuring poets uh, as well as like, you know, hosting free workshops with like, anyone who's attending before those shows get started. Um, and then when the murder of George Floyd happened in Park National Protest, we suspended our weekly slam and uh, that format of that um, and moved on to doing showcases where we highlighted and paid uh, the featuring Black poets um, while also fundraising for our multiple like um, Black-led nonprofit uh, organizations and bail funds, including the Bay Area Anti-Police Project uh, for the Girls, Moms for Housing, the Afro-Urban Society, the Oprah Project, and the Bay Area Anti-Oppression Police Fund, as well as ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing recently, kind of, you know, kind of staying the momentum and kind of just, you know, uh, keeping our show alive as much as we can. Thankfully for us, we've had like, you know, we have like a crew of people like who like, you know, know the tech world and understand all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's been kind of, you know, you know, digging into our, our funds, like, you know, kind of getting people to, like, you know, to um, give them, get them get paid and everything, which is a lot of, I think, the heart of our work right now. And, you know, making sure that we're highlighting um, Black voices right now more than anything. You know, when we, for the month of June and July, we did this for two months straight. We made sure that all the poets that we had on that mic were, um, were all Black poets um, because we knew that that we needed um, for this time for healing to be heard by Black, black, black people. So, yeah, so you all can find Rich Oak Alchemy, Open Slam, and... Do you know it's time to wrap up? Yeah. Hey, cool. Thank you. You can, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and that'll be, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Put those um, links in the chat if you can, Tina. Thank you. <laughs> okay, up next we have Sacred Grounds and Creative Ideas. Hello everyone. So many people here that I know, I'm amazed, then maybe not amazed. So um, my name is Dan Brady and um, what I'm gonna do is post a chunk of things in the uh, chat line, chat thing here. Let me, so um, there's four things, five things. So I'm just gonna go over them because this is, takes you care of before and after in our methods of dealing with things. So the first link is the San Francisco Open Mic Poetry Guide, which is something I did um, when the book, during the time the venues were open. And that's a link to that. Uh, because of all the COVID stuff, everything closed, I took an older idea and you'll see live streaming poetry open mics around the world. What the, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, find links to and entries for this list. I've been to like I've Singapore and Japan and Australia. I even got to Mongolia for about five minutes, but then something happened and I don't know what that is yet. And then, uh, so number two is the live streaming calendar, which uh, I'm looking for anybody who knows of anything. Right below that is the little listing of things that helps me make an entry. Um, the third one is if you're gonna give an email, you wanna have put someone in touch with me that you don't know, that I don't know, that's my webmail portal. Personal email for anybody here is there, right? That's number four. And number five is uh, sort of like my my, my attempt to tell people what I think could be done if we decided to do something and make a difference for the positive better not just toss that in. So Sacred Grounds has been around like 45 years or so. I've been hosting it for what, 10-ish or something. And we switched over to virtual 
uh, Zooming after talking about how we might do things. And so every Wednesday we Zoom, seven o'clock PST. But I, you know, I figure um, we bring people in, we have new people coming from various places and people go. So there's my two minutes. I just saw my two minute timer going, so I must be close to it. So anyway, um, contact me, send me information. I'm, I'm trying to make, build this list. We're about halfway through. The half the hours in a given week have some kind of coverage. So more, more is more, the more the merrier. Thank you so much. I'll mute. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for putting together those lists. That's great. Okay, up next we have the San Francisco Poet Laureate. You all know her as Kim Shuck. You don't all know me, but you might have heard of me. I um, run, at the moment, since the close down, I run three different series, um, one of which meets twice a month. So that's four readings a month. I run one called Poem Jam at the uh, San Francisco Public Library, um, where we've been featuring publications that make a difference for writers in the Bay Area. So, you know, always gathering thoughts on that. Um, then I do two a month for Burden Beckett books called Poem, uh, Poets! Exclamation point. Um, and because of miscommunication with the guy who ended up doing the tech rather than doing it on the first and third Monday of the month, which we used to do, we're now doing the second and fourth Monday of the month. Um, when it starts at seven. So those are always fun. We're going to be featuring um, uh, potential next laureates for the next short while. Because um, I'm in my fourth year of a two year gig and it would be good to have a nap. Um, and then the other series that I run at the moment is called Fire Thieves, which I um, basically uh, capture Paul Corman Roberts to help me to, it's an intergenerational poetry reading, six readers, we've been doing them one a month. This is the 12th. It was a project that was supposed to be a year long that was funded by a, um, a fellowship from the Academy of American Poets. And obviously everything just went very sideways um, towards the end of that. So um, Clara's reading at that one <laughs> Wednesday. It, they're always really great readers and we have a really good time. Um, so I'm doing all of those things. Then uh, come the shutdown, the library asked me if I would curate a poem a day from local poets. Hey Kim, it's time to wrap up. Mm -hmm. A poem a day from local poets, which is, uh, it's um, a lot more than one email exchanged. So uh, today it's D.L. Lang, who used to be the Poet Laureate of Leho. So please go ahead onto the San Francisco Public Library page and check that out. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, up next we have our penultimate check-in from San Mateo County Poet Laureate. If Hello everyone, I'm Eileen hey. Castaneto. Um, so I shifted to virtual and online programming back in March like everyone else, um, heavily relying on collaborations with local libraries and nonprofits and personal connections. A lot of my projects are tied with social justice concerns. For example, with the Housing Leadership Council, we launched a kids poetry and art competition via Zoom um, at the onset of school closures. We asked the kids what home means as well as what it can be. In that sense, they joined a broader conversation of how to build healthy communities, which includes access to adequate and affordable housing for everyone. Um, another successful fundraising project we had was um, a community poem we created uh, for frontliners, where for every line that was submitted, a dollar was donated to the San Mateo County Health Foundation's COVID-19 fund. Um, I'm currently organizing a Peninsula Virtual Book Fest featuring 60 authors, including my friend Kim Shak and also MK Chavez. 
um, in partnership with four local libraries as well as local bookstores happening in September and October. Um, the biggest hurdle currently is funding. Resources right now are stretched very thin and um, all 60 authors that we are featuring in the book fest are doing it pro bono. Um, so aside from grants, I'm exploring the possibility of more fundraising projects in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, um, we have Two Lines Press. Hi everybody, I'll try to be quick. Um, everybody's been very patient. <clears throat> so I'm CJ Evans from Two Lines Press, also from the Center for the Art of Translation. Um, we also run the Two Voices series, which um, does events mostly in San Francisco, but all over the Bay Area with translators and authors from all over the world that we bring here. We usually do maybe 20 events a year, um, both for our own books that we publish with Two Lines Press, but also um, just from any translators or authors that um, are coming through. Um, I've worked with many of you in different capacities. Um, I don't know, I'm just kind of, you know, we shut down in the spring. Uh, we don't usually do events in the, in the summer, so we were kind of shut down for that. We're kind of tentatively opening things back up and starting to plan events. We have a few in September. Um, you know, I'm really curious. We had a lot of support in the spring kind of as we were shutting things down. I think, you know, through bookstores and um, really great events, you know, the last few we did had, a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people coming in. Um, but I'm kind of curious if people are able to kind of maintain that sort of engagement over Zoom kind of for the long term and also how people are doing with things like book sales and fundraising and all that sort of stuff. Because I think the, you know, the online engagement is great, uh, but I worry that it is kind of shallow and fleeting in a way that an in-person event isn't. Uh, so I'm just curious what people have to say about those sorts of things as well. Great, thank you so much. And did I miss anybody? Did, did everybody have a chance? Speak up if, if you were skipped. Okay, I think, I think we got everyone. <laughs> That's great. It was wonderful to hear from, from all of you. I, I took some little, little notes and I just want to um, read out a couple of things really quickly, kind of like a, like a found poem, but, but these are some of the things that caught, caught my attention. Creating truly inclusive events, uh, learning by attending other online events, um, virtual events allowing for greater access, bigger audiences, um, opening things up to people who are more isolated, um, free events, uh, creating connections, new doorways, um, some challenges, knowing how to shift digitally as an organization while helping the audience members to also shift being a challenge, um, having to expand the role of certain employees who work on tech, um, generally fundraising, and some folks have had success with fundraisers. Others are asking about fundraising. Um, video productions being a way to stay in the mind of the community, the importance of video. Uh, let's see what else. Getting people up to speed, doubling, tripling attendance, I already said that. <laughs> Which platform is the best? Uh, what else? Sustaining momentum, hanging on, digging in, and building a list. I'm not sure what that was about, but so those are some of the, just some of the highlights from um, what I heard you talking about. And one of the things I wanted to ask is um, if you all think it would be valuable for poets and writers to present a town hall that would feature somebody who could talk about the different platforms like 
StreamYard, Crowdcast, Zoom, and kind of compare, contrast, and maybe even show a little bit how they work. Um, would that be a value? Would that be something that you'd be interested in signing up for? I see some heads nodding. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and because can um, I just add, can I just yeah. add, I mean, I, I would love something like that, but I think a lot of us have been kind of exploring the different platforms and um, it would be really great to actually also hear about complementary um, services that can help with the different platforms. So, um, and what I mean is like in teaching, I've found it really, um, I kept trying to switch platforms for the teaching that I was doing. And the problem wasn't the teaching, it was that the, each platform has its own limitations. So when you start adding, um, that's when you can find some magic around connection, for example, um, making people feel a little bit more connected in the space if you're having a smaller type of event. So I would love to hear about the platforms plus. I'm not sure if I understand uh, what you mean by complementary platforms. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I don't know, like using Google Board um, with a small group to get everybody uh, while you're on Zoom. Um, I see. You, yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. Good suggestion. I don't know if I can, I can find somebody that knowledgeable, but I, I do know that I can do the first thing. But that's, it's good to hear that suggestion because that'll keep me thinking. Do you all have other suggestions? I mean, I think one of the things that I'm, I've been hearing from folks is um, how to monetize events in this climate. I don't know if anybody has had success or is interested in that, um, but I would be curious to hear from you. Yes, go ahead, Suzanne. Thanks. Um, yeah, I can speak about that a little bit. So we, when we canceled our in-person event, we lost about a third of our revenue because obviously the vast majority of that was via ticket sales and via sponsorships that were tied uh, uh, directly to the in-person event. So we had to sort of reconfigure how we conceptualize sponsorships uh, in the aftermath of the cancellation. And while we have we have had some some early tentative signs of success in, in getting um, a few corporate and nonprofit sponsors for our virtual programming, um, not in huge amounts and not typically at the amounts that they would sponsor in-person programming, um, but it's definitely been something that they've been interested in and we've been able to sort of pitch it to them as a way to reach a much huger audience than they would otherwise reach if they were only um, putting their name or, or branding themselves with one of our in-person events. So that's attractive to some of them. Um, uh, sort of stressing the community aspect, particularly if they're a local based company or nonprofit. And uh, basically the, the labor involved with that has, has just been kind of reconfiguring our entire sponsorship deck so that it specifically spells out what the benefits are to potential sponsors in a virtual setting as opposed to in an in-person setting. So that's taken a lot of legwork in itself and it's been like a big, um, a big endeavor for our development staff and our marketing staff. But we, we have been able to, to transfer some of our in-person sponsorships to virtual, which has been a nice pleasant surprise in which we're building on for the future. It's great to hear. Anybody else have, has anyone else had experience um, with this? Yes, Clara. Hi. Um, we put on the, the play Love of, on the Magpie Bridge, was, which was a live performance from last year. And it, I know at this time it's so difficult to ask people to donate money because everybody's in the same boat. Um, but the play actually did something for us. And we, we got, I mean, small victory. We got we got money coming in because people were moved by seeing the play. So, um, so that's very encouraging for me. And I, and I think that if we can put in, put out uh, products that actually people would enjoy and would love to do it, we will be able to generate, you know, some sort of income from that. Um, it's small, but it's not any, um, 
less than what we, you know, when we had live performance, where we have a very small venue. So the income that generated from the donation was very compatible from what we got when we were doing it live. So that's a good thing. So that was not ticket sales, but suggested donation? Just donation, no suggested, just oh, people okay. to donate. So yeah, so they donated, you know, from a thousand dollars to down to ten dollars. So that was pre pretty good. Yeah. Yes, Ali. Hey, um, I just wanted to say really quickly that something that we found to be helpful, like I said, we normally do, you know, 60 events in a year and we lost a ton of ticket income in the spring because we canceled everything in person and we basically refunded tickets unless people wanted to donate, which people generously did in some cases, but also didn't. And so what we've tried to make our approach for the fall and for the spring is we're doing a lot fewer events and we're doing some events with bigger names that we're gonna charge for because we know that people will pay for it. And then the income from those will hopefully help us do the smaller events that people might not necessarily pay as much for, but should still be heard, different voices and just smaller, smaller guests. And that's kind of a boon of the whole situation is that we can actually do events now that can have a hundred people that would have been awkward in a giant theater and now it's actually very cozy and intimate online. So kind of doing that balance of larger events and smaller events to help support each other, I think is what we're, what we're planning to do. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. And Tino, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, um, kind of piggybacking off what everyone said, uh, I really find that like, you know, donations has been really uh, kind of like how we've kind of sustained Rich Oak a lot. Uh, luckily for us, Berkeley itself, like the Berkeley Poetry Slam was its own show before and it, it was, it was uh, you know, uh, fundraised or had its own grants, uh, its own grant loan and everything. So that's how we were able to pay a lot of the poets through, there, uh, through the Berkeley City grants and everything, uh, which I think I could share a link for y'all and everything for the, all the other shows who are like, you know, um, in Berkeley, but like I'm, it's it's a pretty popular grant, so I'm pretty sure like most folks are already out there, and I think they just I think they just got done distributing like the the money for this um for this quarter, um but also like you know like we also had a Patreon uh, that we opened up like a little earlier this year and everything, and that itself kind of like you know helped us you know set keep uh keep our uh, YouTube uh, page like you know going like you know and also like making it so that we can also pay like our venues too as well like we the the alchemy open mic operates out of the alan bluford center uh yeah, out of oakland and everything and it's a and if anyone knows uh alan bluford or anything it's it um the, the center itself is a anti-police like you know um center and resource center itself like so we are very much uh like you know because we're there we want to make sure like you know with this, those kind of spaces like it, in the midst of gentrification keep open so a lot of what we do uh with our patreon also like we have a tier in there that like a hundred dollars anyone donates to that um basically give uh like that tier in itself goes to straight to the island before dinner we've helped like you know make sure that they like you know that money goes to like whatever they need uh, whether that be rent or anything else they have to put on and then uh, because we because we are connected to a bigger nonprofit uh, called Bay Area Creative, um, all our and any donations that we get through Patreon are tax deductible. So that's a, a really big pitch I think that we've have been able to give to people who like who are like, hey, like why should I like you know donate? But hey, that tax deduction like is kind of like a um, like you know something that I think a lot of people like um, gravitate towards. Like you know like being able to get your money back or like you know like paying for arts and not paying for like, you know, a really like, you know, this dystopic like government and I'm not going to go on around on that, but you know, anyway. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tino. Um, it's good to hear about the Patreon account. Uh, I th Stacey, do you have your hand up? Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, so we've been doing virtual events, um, I guess so, since about May. Um, and it's really challenging on a number of levels. I mean, we can talk about all the folks who turn up and, you know, it's it, initially it's very exciting, right? Like you have people from different countries, different states. Um, but it is really hard time for authors who have books, new books, 
um, we are not seeing, we're seeing pretty dismal sales. It's pretty rare that people are buying books. Um, Zoom as a platform for e-commerce is not great. You know, we put in links like what we're doing here in the chat, you know, here's the book, buy the book. We, we do pitches. We talk about, you know, the author makes a pitch, we make a pitch. So we're, we're starting to rethink things because I don't really think it's sustainable. Um, other bookstores, independent bookstores in the United States and other organizations um, are, are ticketing, you know, bookstores are ticketing. Um, so one bookstore that I like, they have an option where, you know, if you want to come to the event, you can attend for free. Nobody's going to be left out. But there's more of a sliding scale. Um, you can donate. A ticket price could cost um, the cost of a book. Either you pick it up at City Lights or we mail it to you. Um, so yeah, it's not really rosy. <laughs> I would say the virtual events series. Uh, so yeah, Jamie, if you wanted to pursue someone talking more about platform, sure. Um, Crowdsource was another one that's really popular and there are people using it. We had all sorts of technical problems. Um, it is a work in progress. It is a completely different way of doing events. It's nothing like being in a space with people. People are not motivated in the same way to purchase books. And, you know, I'd like that to change, but I don't know. But I think it's good to be realistic about it as sort of a new model of doing things. And, you know, and we're relying on People like Zoom and crowd, you know, who are these people, you know, it's like, it's not, I don't think it's my people and, you know, and, and there'll, there'll be more platforms evolving and, and whatnot. And, you know, Zoom works, it works beautifully for this. My children are in Zoom for school, but, you know, it's, it's challenging and I'm not sure how sustainable. Yeah. I hear you. Um, yes, CJ. I just wanted to, I'm kind of curious, um, I mean, I feel what Stacy just said <laughs> very deeply, um, but I'm curious if anybody's found any sort of success or if, Jamie, if there's a way when you do that kind of like platform thing, like what are the best ways to, to kind of provide links for books, for authors within these various platforms and stuff like that? Because the, you know, the chat links are great, but if there's actually, if anybody's having success, getting people to buy books through this system in any sort of regular way, I would, that would be worth the price of admission right there. Great, yeah. Uh, Robert, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, Dan, I'll get to you next. Uh, this is to CJ and Stacy. Uh, uh, we've had some success in offering a workshop where we develop the relationship uh, with the participants and the instructor and uh, finding that uh, participants are more inclined to uh, follow through with uh, purchase of materials uh, suggested in the chat, um, but less so uh, just through a strict reading where it's just a performative uh, event. Mm -hmm. Um, Dan, did you want to say something? You're muted. Yeah, um, just going back uh, when you were talking about the different things, uh, the listing you mentioned, that was, I guess that was uh, the idea that I had that I put the links in there for. Um, the thing that I think is interesting and important about that is that it allows people from all over the world to communicate with one another and build a, a poetic community. Uh, from what I've seen from the people here, there are probably uh, several venues that are online that I don't know about and could be added in. But what I've seen is people uh, networking in ways that it just, you know, wouldn't be happening except for the circumstances where, that we're in. As far as sacred grounds go, you know, we've always been uh, free and, you know, I do the Zoom thing. I set that up for it and, and let my Zoom be used by other, a couple of other venues now since they can't really do their own. But it's the networking and finding new people and connecting and giving support. Um, uh, the, 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 the open mic itself is just the first part. 
it's like a point of departure. If someone knows software better than I, they could take this idea and make it so that when someone went to the website, there'd be links to the live streaming video automatically set up. But I, I, you know, I did it myself and I don't know much about programming. So um, it's the, the idea is meant for someone to say, hey, I can make this better or I have venues to add. It's really about other people putting things in and letting people connect with each other. So that's the, my two cents worth. Everybody here is really involved with what's going on and there's lots of ways of solving it and cross pollination as I used to call it as a teacher or one teacher helps another. Um, it's really the way to go. The, this is very, a very important event because there's links in here that I'm going to be checking. And, and, and I think that's very, very important. And I want to thank you and your, your organization, Poets and Writers, for setting this up, as well as for everybody else contributing as they have. So I'm going to stop. I'm mute. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, before, you know, before we wrap up, I just wanted to remind you all that Poets and Writers is making grants our, our, our wonderful little mini grants uh, for virtual events. So we've adjusted our, our guidelines for our grant program uh, before sheltering in place. Uh, we were only funding live in-person events. Well, we, we can't do that. So we very quickly said, okay, we'll fund virtual events too. They have to be live. They have to be broadcast, you know, live. They can't be pre-recorded and then shared later. Um, and we are making uh, virtual, I'm sorry, they're not virtual grants. They're actual real grants, real money that we send to writers. <laughs> and um, we are waiving the matching requirement. So we're not asking organizations to match what they ask of us. Like I said, the grants are very small, uh, about $50 to $250 for a reading. And we also fund creative writing workshops. So if any of you are interested in applying for these to help pay writers, I, I would um, recommend that you check out our online application. You can go to pw.org slash funding and I'll put that in the, or maybe Dan Tran, could you please put that link in the chat for folks? Um, and if you have any questions, you can please feel free to email me and Dan Tran will put my email in the chat as well. Um, and I encourage you to apply that the grants are, they're small and limited, but it's a nice way to reward the writer you might be featuring and the application process is pretty easy. So, so yeah, that is, I mean, if any of you have any questions about the grant program or any questions for me, um, was that Taryn? Did you have a question? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought you raised your hand. Um, just feel free to email me. And I also wanted to point out on the agenda that there is a link to an article that Poets and Writers editorial staff has been adding to um, called, um, well, what is it called? Resources for Writers in the Time of Coronavirus. And that's a really great list of um, financial resources for writers and publishers, and I think also bookstores. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, that's a great place to look if you are looking for ideas. And other than that, um, I hope you'll join us for the first uh, California Virtual Town Hall meeting with a guest speaker on September 17th. It will be on Zoom. And our guest spe speaker is a really wonderful writer and arts activist, Peter J. Harris. He lives here in LA um, and he's going to be talking about the importance of happiness. <laughs> so I think it should be um, pretty interesting and inspiring and different. So I hope you'll join us for that. And I will definitely be um, thinking about getting a town hall together for you about different platforms for your events. Um, okay, one, one last question from Paul. Oh, I was about to ask about those funding links, but it looks like they just dropped in just now. So never mind. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes. Okay. And so everybody, thank you so much for your time, um, for sharing all these things that you've been experiencing and also just for persevering. I know it's really hard um, and I think we'll get through it if everyone just kind of digs in and, and, you know, keeps it going as best as they can. So thank you very much. And I will send a list uh, of everyone who was here. So you have each other's info. I'll send the chat. And if we do another check-in, I hope you'll uh, join us again.